Good morning. <laughs> it's, it's traditional when one gives a talk in physics to say ahead of time that one is very happy to be here giving the talk. I must say that I'm, I'm particularly happy to be here giving this talk. Uh, <clears throat> Carl has done a wonderful job laying out the, the general framework of the experiments. Uh, I will be presenting one or two more fundamental ideas, introductory ideas, and then describing a couple of the experiments that we're doing in this talk. So uh, I'll tell you who's, who's doing the Bose condensation and uh, particularly why it's very difficult to do and, and uh, what's sort of new about uh, Bose-Einstein condensation as a system, as a macroscopic quantum system. And then I'll tell you some, some particular experiments we're doing. And I want to acknowledge right at the beginning uh, 12 years of very talented, very dedicated, very uh, personally to me inspirational graduate students and postdocs with whom I've worked all, all these years. And uh, in particular, I show you a picture of uh, some of my early students and postdocs. All four of these people, uh, Mike Anderson, Debbie Jin, Mike Matthews, and Jason Encher, you'll see around Stockholm on Monday, I think they'll be somewhat more formally attired. So where does Bose-Einstein condensation happen? Well, it happens here uh, in Boulder, where the plains meet the mountains. You can see this flat part here extends all the way out to Missouri, and this goes more or less straight up into the uh, sky. And more particularly, because I'm an experimenter, I have to show you the picture of, of my favorite machine. <laughs> uh, I work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I'm actually by federal, US federal statute required to tell you that the distance from here to here is 2.54 centimeters. <laughs> okay, why then is Bose-Einstein condensation interesting? Uh, I'm sure in Sweden and certainly in the United States there are many uh, fashion magazines, magazines about celebrities and so on. And, and it's traditional in these magazines, every year at the end of the year they say, they give you a list of the 10 most intriguing people. So I'm going to, uh, I'd like you to, as an exercise, to try and compose for yourself a list of the 10 most intriguing physics. And uh, to, to narrow it down a little bit, I say it, physics over a range which is larger than an atomic nucleus and, and smaller than a, a planet, say. Um, the, side, the sort of the human scale uh, physics, everyone would come up with his or her own list. It's impossible to have any, no, no two lists would be the same. But I wager that many people's lists would include in that 10 at least two and possibly even three of the following things. Superfluidity, superconductivity, lasing. And I mentioned these three in particular. They certainly are on my list because they have something in common, which is they all involve the macroscopic occupation of a single state. A great many particles, be they, be they photons in a laser, or uh, helium atoms in superfluidity, or, or Cooper pairs in, in, uh, in superconductivity, a great many particles all occupying the same wave function. And this also is the thing which best characterizes Bose-Einstein condensation. So ahead of time, you might think, well, Bose-Einstein condensation is somehow like these other things. Which, which we, we know to be interesting. <clears throat> and there are uh, considerable overlap. You can think of uh, superfluidity as being a liquid, superconductivity as happening in a solid. Lasing, this is a pure energy, and now as we sort of fill in a box here with a, a, a macroscopic occupation at a gas, the gas phase Bose-Einstein condensation. There's a lot of overlap between these ideas. Analogies, also a lot of contrast. I'm going to be talking to you about, in particular, about sort of overlaps between Bose-Einstein condensation and superfluidity, but not exclusively. Uh, <coughs> Carl Wyman mentioned to you that as atoms get colder and colder, they act less and less like particles and, and more and more like waves. The, the act of making atoms, or making anything colder, makes them also somehow wavier at the same time. How can we understand this? Uh, I know that there are some students in the audience, and, and we've, I'm sure you've already learned about the, the uncertainty principle, which is that uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is that 
you can't both measure where something is and how fast it's going. If you know where something is very well, so its uncertainty in its position is small, you always must have a large uncertainty in its momentum. This product can never be smaller than Planck's constant. So if you think about it, in some sense, if you put a bunch of atoms into a box, you know that if the atoms are all in the box and the box is not moving, the average momentum of any given atom in that box is zero. And when you measure the temperature of that box, when you find out how hot the box is, you're measuring the spread in momentum. After all, the, the uh, temperature of the box is just proportional to the, to the mean square momentum. And therefore, somehow, when you measure the temperature of this box, you're measuring the spread in momentum of the atoms in this box. And as the, as the temperature gets colder and colder, you know that the uncertainty in the momentum of the atoms, it gets, it gets with more and more certainty, the momentum of these atoms becomes zero as, you, as the temperature gets closer and closer to zero. And therefore, the uncertainty in the position becomes larger and larger. And it's really this uncertainty, the fact that you can't really know where an atom is, which is, is the, the quantum wavelength of the atom, which is uh, the thermal de Broglie wavelength of the atom, which gets larger and larger as the temperature gets smaller and smaller. Um, I want to explain to you now why it is that making Bose-Einstein condensation in a gas is a hard thing to do. Because indeed, it's a very hard thing to do. As Carl told you, it took, it took many, many years, uh, a lot of ingenuity on the part of a great many people. Uh, I have here a, a, a plot, uh, the log of temperature in this direction, density in this direction. If our condition for a Bose-Einstein condensation is that the thermal de Broglie wavelength has to be in comparable to the interatomic spacing, we can make sort of a line here, down here at higher densities and lower temperatures. We have Bose condensation up here at higher densities or lower density, uh, higher temperatures or lower density. We don't have Bose condensation. And I, I can also make a similar plot now of uh, basically all of thermodynamics. I'm going to try and put on this plot for you here. Typically, in, in thermodynamics, you have what's called a phase diagram. It shows you where the liquids and the solids are. And you may be more familiar with it with temperature on one scale and pressure on one scale. But you can also plot temperature on one scale and density on the other scale. And in a, in a plot like this, they all, look exactly, they all look essentially the same. Up here, you have gases at high temperatures and low densities. Over here, you have all of condensed matter physics. And there's a large region. There's a wedge in here, which is, which is forbidden. <clears throat> by thermodynamics. And what I mean by forbidden is, is uh, suppose we tried, I, 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 I don't have any units on this plot because this applies to everything. If you, whether you're using any particular material will fall on this plot, it changes the scale, but it all, the shape of the plot always looks the same. I, suppose this is for water, and I take a water and I, and I arrange it at this temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius. Say I have a one liter bottle of water and I put 100 uh, centiliters of water in it. And now I've got a, dense, a mean density in there of 0.1 grams per centimeter. But of course, I don't actually have water at 20 Celsius and, and uh, 0.1 grams per centimeter density, because what really happens is at the bottom of the jar, you have water. And at the top of the jar, you have water vapor. But nowhere in the jar do you have, gas, do you have water in this forbidden region. This thermodynamics doesn't allow it. Why am I emphasizing this forbidden region of thermodynamics? Because if we put the two former plots together, this plot and this plot together, we find, again, for any given material, Bose-Einstein condensation occurs down here in this region, which is forbidden by thermodynamics, unless you're at very high density. But at very high density, things solidify, and solids can't Bose condense. The only material for what, uh, that's an exception to this is helium. Helium does not solidify uh, in the Bose-Einstein condensation regime, but it does liquefy. And in some sense, the point of the research that we've been engaged in is to make a gas phase Bose condensate, something which is uh, much lower density, easier to understand in a, in a single particle model. And to do this, we have to come down here into a risk region which is, is forbidden. Now, you might ask yourself, if it's, it's forbidden, does that mean it's impossible? And, and the answer to this really, really lies in theology. And by theology, I don't mean that you must believe that it happens. But in fact, what you learn very soon in any theological studies is that the things which are truly impossible, no one bothers to forbid. So the fact that it's forbidden <coughs> is actually a very good sign. And, and, and another important theological uh, insight is that um, if, it weren't, uh, if it weren't fun, also, again, they wouldn't bother to forbid it. So I think we have very good motivation to proceed in this direction. And in some sense, the history of Bose-Einstein condensation through the, through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s 
is in efforts to come down from a gas down into this forbidden region to where Bose-Einstein condensation happens. I'm, I'm making this very mysterious, but of course, to the chemist, this is familiar. This forbidden region is familiar under the term of supersaturation. In physics, we call it metastability. If you have a gas and you keep it at low enough densities, it's possible to come down here. So the motivation then is to go actually to rather low densities, which forces us then to lower temperatures, as Carl has told you. What are both Einstein condensations like? Uh, Carl's already told you they tend to be rather small by, the, by a standard of a chemical sample, perhaps only a femtogram. But uh, in Wolfgang's lab, now it's more than 10 million. And in and Dan Kleppner and Tom Graytack's lab, it's uh, more than 100 million atoms. It's very, very cold, much colder than liquid helium. Uh, the samples are, in some sense, quite thin. The, these, this little ball of atoms that we form in this magnetic trap is uh, a million times less dense than the air molecules in front of you. But even though it's so tenuous, uh, the density is so low, the, the texture of this is gelatinous, um, like uh, aspic. I don't know what the <coughs> appropriate Swedish dish is, but something which is sort of uh, goopy. And we have aspic, gelatin, jello. Anyway. Jello? How is it? How is it that it develops this texture, this goopy texture? Okay, we have all of the atoms <coughs> in this condensate are doing exactly, are performing, are, are exactly in the same quantum wave. You might ask yourself, well, if every single atom is doing exactly the same wave, do these atoms collide into each other? And the answer is yes or no. They don't collide into them into each other in the, in the traditional sense that this atom bumps into this atom, and one atom goes up, and one atom goes down, and something like this, because the Bose-Einstein condensation mechanism keeps the atoms all in the same wave. But what does happen is that because the atoms are in the same wave, and they're undergoing what are called virtual collisions in some sense, there's a shift in their energy. They feel a repulsion from one another, which we describe as a change in their energy, which is proportional to the density. Uh, the, the, this shift in energy per atom is proportional to the density and to something which is uh, proportional to the square root of the, of the collisional cross-section, of the probability of, of colliding. And we usually take the positive square root, but not always. And the effect of this repulsion, then, is if we have this magnetic trap, this, this parabolic bowl in which we're holding the atoms, the atoms, instead of sitting in a little tiny blip, which is the size of the 0, 0, 0 state of this three-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator, the, they, they repel each other out, and they self-consistently assume a size which is quite a bit larger, 10, 20, 50 times larger. It, and uh, if the, the bowl that you're holding the atoms in is a parabola, the density distribution is an inverted parabola. And this is sort of the, the shape of the atoms that we're working with. Now, um, I'm only going to do this for a little while, but I am going to show you an equation. <laughs> this is the gross pitayevsky equation. Uh, for the physicists and the chemists in the audience, you'll recognize this as the Schrodinger equation. Basically, this is a, 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 a differential equation for the, the wave that describes these atoms. And it looks just like the Schrodinger equation. We have a kinetic energy term, an external potential term. And here's the surprise term, a self-interacting term, a nonlinear term, which is, again, is proportional to the scattering length, this, this probability of the atoms scattering from each other, which gives you the repulsive effect Usually in sodium and in rubidium 87 is repulsive and gives you the big blob. In the early experiments of Randy Hewlett, uh, he works in lithium 7, which is, which is a, a negative a, attractive condensate, which tends to implode. And I'll come back to this later. So the effect of this interaction is it makes the condensate bigger. And it also gives it its sort of springiness or, or gelatinous texture. Uh, here is a, you know, the first experiment of condensates that I'm going to show you today, which is Simply, you put the condensates in this magnetic bowl. And then the experiment we do is we take the, the magnets and we increase the strength of the current and then decrease it, increase it, decrease it. We cause the bowl to oscillate like this. And the condensate, in turn, oscillates. And after we've got it jiggling, we, we turn off the oscillation. The bowl just sits there quiescently, and the condensate continues to quiver. And you can see a series of images taken at one millisecond intervals. And you can see the condensate th sort of throbbing here in response to being, to being uh, driven. The combination of all of the atoms being in a single wave, and they're having this sort of uh, self, this repulsive interaction, the combination of its being a single wave condensate and a sort of gelatinous texture, gives you, in the end, superfluidity. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the nature of superfluidity, which, of course, has been, been seen since the 1930s in liquid helium. I think this is a lovely system for studying superfluidity, this miraculous 
this miraculous property where the viscosity of a fluid can, goes, vanishes. Uh, this is a wonderful system in Bose-Einstein condensation to, to study it. <clears throat> Let's see how we can come to understand the origin of superfluidity. Here's a few more equations, but uh, I brought a, a prop. So if, if, the, if the equations bore you, bear with me here for a second. We describe, uh, I'm trying, this is supposed to indicate sort of a, a strip. You can think of it as a strip of fabric with a, with a twist which has been put into it. You can think of the width of this strip as being proportional to the wave function, somehow proportional to the density, essentially, or to the square root of the density. And then the angle, the twist, the angle of the twist as you come down here, as you see as you come down, the twist goes further around, is, is proportional to this, this uh, somewhat uh, uh, spooky concept of the quantum phase. And then the velocity of the atoms is just proportional to the gradient of this phase. So, uh, if I take this, imagine that this is my condensate as I move down here and I gradually put a twist into it. That corresponds to there being a flow in my condensate coming down here. And if I do something sort of sneaky, which is I get the condensate moving by putting a twist in its face and I, and I put it now into a loop, I find I'm in an unusual situation. I've got a loop here and, and in some sense I'm stuck with this loop. Now imagine this loop corresponds now to the flow of condensate going around, say I've got a pipe that looks like a, a donut, uh, a, a, circ, a toroidal tube uh, that the, the, the flow can go around in. That corresponds to uh, a loop of fabric with a single twist in it. And you can see as long as, this, 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 I, keep this, as, long as I keep this uh, belt, if I don't tear it, I'm stuck with this twist. I can make little changes in the belt here and here, but I can't get the twist out of here. And the fact that it's not convenient for me to get this twist out of here really is the microscopic explanation for why it is that you have superfluidity. No small changes I can do in this because of, think of it as topology, can get rid of this twist. This is why you can have a fluid flowing around in this loop. And even though you can have some, you ought to have some friction, perhaps the walls of this chamber are a little bit rough, the fluid still continues to flow round and round. Unless I break it. Okay, the only way I can stop it is by breaking it. And that can cost a lot of energy. It corresponds to making this, at least at one point, very infinitely thin, suppressing the density all the way to zero. And here's where the gelatinousness of it comes into. Because this, this has, the gas repels each other, it has a pressure, and it costs energy for me to try, try and drive the energy to zero anywhere. For the experts, <coughs> I mentioned to you the following uh, amusing fact about condensates, and I'm going to come back to this again which is that uh, now here's, my, again, my toroidal loop. And imagine I have flow going around. it corresponds to the arrow. Uh, this arrow is the phase, the angle of the belt. And you can see as I go once around here, I've got a loop. And if I constrain this arrow to point in the same direction of this arrow, because in fact, it's just the same spot on this winding, I can't get rid of this winding unless suppose someone comes along and says, no, you stupid arrows, you're not constrained to remain on the transparency free your mind and burst free of this two-dimensional world you live in and tilt out of the plane like this. I hope this is clear. So it is possible to get rid of this winding without anywhere doing anything discontinuous anywhere if somehow this loop, in, if these arrows, instead of just being constrained to point somewhere on, the, on, the, on a circle, if they could point anywhere on a sphere. Now, you could do this if you lived in a, a more complicated uh, order parameter space, not to drown you in jargon, but if instead of your order parameter being U1, if it were SU2, OK, for the experts in the field. And this can happen if your, if your condensate is not made from individual monadic atoms, but from atoms with composite structure inside them. And I'll just take this opportunity to tell you about some of the, the tools in our ultra-cold alkali toolkit, OK? Uh, making both condensation with alkali atoms, there are many experimental uh, tricks available to us. And Wolfgang will be telling you about some of you. And I'm going to tell you about some of them today. Uh, I think Wolfgang will tell you perhaps about measurements of the density and the momentum and the energy and velocity distributions. You can hold them. Carl has told you about sort of some of the simplest of the magnetic traps in which you can hold the atoms. But in fact, these, the, the bottles, if you will, in which you can hold these condensates have a great deal of flexibility. They can be essentially one-dimensional bottles or two-dimensional bottles. They're being done now in these microfabricated waveguides, time-varying potentials. 
Uh, one can do studies in, in, the, uh, in which one probes the, the internal coherence between the different states or the external coherence of the wave function. Uh, alkalis come in fermionic flavors, so people now are making degenerate Fermi Cs using the same technology, hopefully soon to see something like uh, BCS superfluidity, except it's predicted to be occur perhaps as, as, as high as one half of the Fermi temperature. They have internal structure, which is what I'm going to really talk to you about today. If you look inside the atom, it has different parts. And the fact that the atom have different parts very fundamentally changes the, the nature of the wave function that the, that the atoms uh, describe the atoms. Uh, here's a picture of a rubidium atom. <coughs> it's got a, uh, a positive ionic core and around it a, a single valence electron a little, in a little cloud. The, both the ionic core of the atom and its, and its electron have a spin, which can be up or down in various other directions. And very roughly speaking, rubidium, comes, rubidium 87 has these two different configurations in which the electron and the nucleus point in the same direction in which they point in opposite directions. And for convenience, we describe them with these nice intuitive numbers f equal 2 and f equal 1. Never mind, it's just the labels for these things. We call it state 1 and state 2. This is the hyperfine structure of the atoms. And we do experiments with the condensates typically using two of the, of the substates of these things. And it makes yourself, you can think of it as a little, the atom is having a little spin which can point up or it can point down. And um, if we apply a microwave to it, we can co coherently convert the atoms from the, the down state to the up state and back again. If we start with all the atoms in the one state, if 100% of the atoms are in the one state, and we turn on this microwave, the atoms go down to the other state, back up. These are Rabi oscillations, which can go for many, many, many cycles. If we turn on the microwave just for a little while, it's called a pi over 2 pulse. We put half of the atoms in one state and half of the atoms in another state. If we leave on the microwave a little longer, we can take all of the atoms from the one state, and they go away, and the atoms all appear in the two state. That's called a pi pulse. These two, if we turn off the microwaves, the atoms do not spontaneously interconvert between these two states. And uh, they become really distinguishable fluids. So here's an experiment in which we start with all the atoms in the one state, which I've painted red here. Here's the little bowl in which we keep the atoms. We turn on the, the microwaves and give it a pi over 2 pulse. Now the atoms are half in the one state, half in the two state. The atoms interact with each other and separate out. The two atoms sink, if you will, down to the bottom of the trap. And the one atoms float out to the edge of the trap. And it makes a little ball. If, you are, if, you've, if you've created a, a spherically symmetric bowl, uh, in, this, in this image, we're sensitive only to the atoms in the one state. And it appears as a spherical shell around the two atoms, which, are not, which we're not uh, looking at in this picture. We can use <coughs> these two different fluids and our ability to coherently convert the atoms from one state into the other state to, do, to engineer the, the wave functions of these condensates. Here's my engineering scheme here. I'm the son of an engineer, and so this is a very appealing to me. You can see here I have a, a, a crane, and, uh, which can lift up to 7 gigahertz, which is actually the energy spacing between the two states. We start with uh, all of the atoms in the, in the one state, and, um, or in the two state if we prefer. And in a spatially selective way, we can take pieces of this wave function and move it up, if you like, into the other state. And as we move from one state into the other state, we can, we can modify the phase and in this way construct in this upper state a, a wave function with whatever you know, amplitude and phase we like with, with their limits. So we can, we can create wave functions in this way. And, and uh, one of the first things that we did using this technique is to build a vortex. A vortex is um, when you pull the plug from your bathtub and you see the little uh, whirling water rushing down in, into, into the drain. This is a, a classical vortex. A quantum vortex is the sort of smallest possible unit of, of vorticity that you can have in which, in which the corresponds to exactly one unit of rotation around, which is described in quantum language as having the phase go from 0 to pi over 2 to pi to 3 pi over 2, all the way back to 2 pi, one cycle of phase as you go once around the outside. And we do this by starting all the atoms in one state and bit by bit moving it to the upper state. This part, we move to the upper state with phase 0. This part, we move to the upper state with phase pi. This part in the middle, we leave right where it is, because in the end, you always have to have a little hole in the middle of your vortex so the phase is, doesn't do something discontinuous. And that we, we leave that, these other atoms as a plug in our vortex. Here you can see a picture of a condensate 
It's turning into a vortex. Uh, very faintly, you can see the atoms here in the one state, which appear white in this image. And we turn on the microwave in this spatially selective way. And out of the mist emerges this black ring, which is the vortex. Or equivalently, we start with the atoms in the two state as a dark black splotch here. Turn on the microwave, and out of the mist emerges this white ring, which is now a vortex in the one state. Here's an image of one of these vortices. <coughs> you can see here, uh, here's these shadow pictures that Carl has, has presented to you before. And, and uh, I've just shown this in three dimensional here. Here's a vortex. The atoms are in the one state. It, <coughs> it, when we took this picture, our camera is set up so we don't see the atoms in the two state. We only see the atoms in the one state. If we suddenly apply a pulse of microwave, we can take all the one atoms and put them into the two state. Now we look over here, we don't see the ring anymore. Instead, we see a little ball in the middle. Basically, in this image, there's a ball of atoms in the middle, which we can't see. After we turn on the microwave, they appear. They're converted into the state that we can see. The atoms in the ring, which we can see now, go into a ring which we can't see. So now we can see the outside of the condensate, which is a ring, outside of the vortex, which is a ring, and the inside of the vortex, which is a plug like this. And it's possible, so far we're imaging only the, call it the square magnitude, the, the, the square magnitude of the wave function. But it's also possible to image the phase of this wave function. Because if instead of applying a pi pulse with a microwave, if we apply a pi over 2 pulse, so the atoms are half in this state and half in this state, we will see an interference, a quantum interference between the ring and between the plug. And so we'll remove this little piece of paper here. And you can see down here in the shadow the characteristic Pac-Man shape. On this side, we have uh, uh, probably people don't play Pac-Man anymore. But on, on this side, uh, we play evaporative cooling. I think that's the latest, uh, the latest video game. On this side, we have constructive interference. This part of the wave function interferes with this part of the wave function. And, and, it's, and, it's, and, the, and you get a lot of, lot of wave function. Or on the other side, we have destructive interference. And on a pixel by pixel basis, you can combine these three images and extract the, the cosine of the phase uh, between these two states. And you can see that as you go once around, once around this ring, the cosine goes from 1 to 0 to minus 1 back to 0. You see one cosinusoidal, cosinusoidal cycle. So we can image the phase of this wave function as you go, of, of this vortex if you go around. The, uh, going back to my, to my engineering analogy now, you can think of us constructing this wave function up here. We use this, but we can think of this original sort of as a this original state sort of as a scaffold. We can construct this wave function here. Then we no longer need the scaffold, and we can shine light which is resonant with only these atoms and not with the other atoms. Blow them away, and now the there's no longer a plug here, and the vortex shrinks down around to a tiny little pinhole here in the middle, which can't vanish because, as you know, the phase wraps from zero all the way around to two pi. And right here in the middle is a singularity where the phase can't be 0, pi, 2 pi, all at the same time. And so the density just goes to 0 there as a tiny little defect, and you like, if you like, in the quantum wave function. Here's a picture of that happening. Here's the ring. And we gradually blow the atoms away, and the ring gets uh, the plug. We blow the plug away. The plug gets smaller and smaller until finally we can't see it at all. But we know it's there. The way we know there's still a little hole there is we can suddenly turn off the magnetic trap. The repulsion of the gas blows the cloud apart. And afterwards, we have a look at what we see. And let's get this right here. So here's the ring. It shrinks down as we blow away the stuff in the atom. We turn off the magnetic trap. It blows up to a much bigger ball. And right there in the middle, we can see this tiny little plug, which is where the, vort which is where the vortex is. And we've done a number of studies over time. We see that this vortex processes around. Uh, it drifts around like a. Uh, like a hurricane confined in the Gulf of Mexico or something like this. It, uh, there's, a, there's a mode in which the, the uh, a sort of a, a meteorological mode in which the tornado moves around through this, uh, through this material. There are other ways to make vortices, and, and Wolfgang is going to talk to you about it a little bit. And um, I show you this slide only because it's, I think, the single most beautiful image to come out of my laboratory, and I'm so proud of it. So this is an enormous number of vortices, uh, somewhere in excess of 100 vortices, all created in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a particularly large condensate. I love this picture. I'm sorry, it's not connected to my talk. <coughs> uh, 
as a, a final example of the, of the consequences of internal structure, the fact that the atoms are, are not uh, you know, Aristotelian indivisible things, but, but things with structure inside them, I'm going to talk to you about uh, <coughs> something called uh, Feshbach resonances. This is ever so slightly more technical than the rest of my talk, um, but uh, I will show you uh, one or two more pretty pictures at the end. <laughs> um, I, I've talked about the fact that these, uh, these uh, condensates can be described by a, a wave function which has a, a really a single parameter in it, which is this uh, scattering length, the, the, the which is proportional somehow to the likeliness of two atoms wanting to collide with each other. What determines this scattering length of an atom? Think of two atoms as feeling a potential. At very close range, this potential is very large and positive. They don't want to bump into each other. At intermediate range, they're sort of an attractive well. And then, of course, when they're far away, they don't feel each other at all. This potential supports bound states, molecular bound states. And the scattering length is entirely determined by whether that last bound state of potential was right there at the, right there at the continuum or not. If it's a little bit below, the, the scattering length is very, very positive. If it's a little bit above, the scattering length is very negative. If it's right at the, uh, if the, if this bound state here is right at the continuum, the scattering length is infinite, and, and so on. So, if you somehow had, were able to adjust the depth of the potential between two atoms, so now by I, I change u naught up and down, I adjust the depth between the potential. I would have the ability to tune the scattering length from positive through zero down to negative infinity, positive and infinity down through zero. I could have it be any, anywhere I want. You might think that we are OK, but two atoms, they interact. They have some strength of interaction. It's given to us by God. We're stuck. But it turns out that there's some wonderful tricks using, involving the internal structure of the atoms, which allow us, in some cases, to adjust the scattering length. Again, because the atoms have this internal structure, if we start with these atoms, again, in this, in this anti-aligned state with the nucleus spinning up and the electron spinning down, we combine them into a molecule. We can combine them into a molecule in two different ways. In one case, the molecules, the, the nuclei are both pointing up in the molecule and the electrons down. In the other case, the nuclei are anti-aligned and so are the electrons. There's two different molecules that this atom can bounce, can then combine into and still preserve angular momentum. This gives us a knob, a, 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 a button we can push to adjust these atoms. Uh, these, two, these two molecules have very different energy, but the relative energy between these two states depends on the magnetic field because the electrons where all the magnetic moment lives, have very different projections onto the, onto the ambient magnetic field. And I haven't really drawn this to scale. It turns out, turns out that by adjusting the magnetic field, we can, buy, we can bring a bound state of this atom right to the continuum of this molecule. And the atoms are coming in in this channel. I'm sorry to drown you here in a little uh, molecular jargon. But what it means is that we have the ability by changing the ambient magnetic field, we can tune the scattering length from, from negative to, to infinitely negative, all the way up to infinitely positive, down back through zero again, so it can be positive, negative, anything we want. The, the possibility of doing this of atoms, and in particular in condensates, was, was uh, pointed out, thank you, five minutes, was pointed out by um, Baudouin Verhaar, and therefore we call these Feshbach resonances. Okay, so. Here's a, here's a, <clears throat> these exist in, in, basically these exist in all the alkali atoms, but they are, um, in only in some of the alkali atoms do these fields exist at a, a convenient uh, field, which is also good for magnetic trapping and experimentally accessible. Here's a, a condensate. These experiments, I should say, are done in, in Carl's lab, uh, the ones I'm going to show you just here, but uh, have been also done, of course, in, in Wolfgang's lab and, and uh, Dan Heinzen in Texas. Here we have a, a relatively small condensate with a relatively small uh, scattering length at a field of, say, 162 Gauss. Now we change the, the field, the field in the middle of the trap just a few Gauss. Um, say we go up only to 157 Gauss. Now the interaction between the atoms is the scattering length is much larger. We're on this sort of positive branch where we come from negative through zero heading up towards positive and infinity. The condensate is much more self-repulsive, and it gets bigger and bigger. And we can gradually tune this up to, to, uh, to places where the scattering length now is, is uh, almost inconceivably large. And we get these very, very large condensates, very tenuous as they, as they repel each other. A trick which, uh, which can happen is we can change this magnetic field very rapidly on the scale of the experiment. So we can create ourselves a, a large condensate with a positive scattering length, and then very quickly change from 
159 Gauss to, say, 171 Gauss, the scattering light goes from positive to negative. And now the condensate, instead of blowing up and being repulsive, is self-attractive. It pulls itself in. And as it pulls itself in, the density goes up, and it pulls itself in more. And then the density goes up any high, even higher, and it pulls itself in quite violently. And you see an implosion. Um, Here's a condensate with 10,000 atoms in it, and this is the time since the scattering length goes from zero to negative. And this cloud is imploding. You don't see it getting very much smaller because this is right at the resolution limit of our optics. But you do see it basically going away because the atoms are falling in on themselves and sort of being consumed. I can show you the same data with the scale turned up, and you can see that uh, as the condensate falls in on itself, there's an implosion, but there's a corresponding explosion of very, very hot atoms. I should tell you, these experiments are done at extraordinarily low temperatures, perhaps only 3 nanokelvin. So when I tell you extraordinarily hot, I mean this gas bursting out here is 100 times the ambient temperature, or 200 nanokelvin. But think of this as the explosive uh, halo of the, of, the, of the supernova. Done in bosons, it's called a, a bosonova. And it, so, we, so we see it now exploding outwards like this. <coughs> This is an interesting topic. I'm trying to just in the last minute or two to give you a feeling of things which are sort of now at the, of the cutting edge of where we are going of, of uh, condensates, condensate research. And I'll give you one more example. In some ways, I think it may be even more interesting rather than going to the, to the self-attractive case to go to the positive case. In physics, one of the most serious, most, one of the sort of enduring mysteries in physics that people understand very poorly is liquids. Solids, gases, this is how we all make our living. Liquids are, are a great mess. <coughs> and here's a, a handy dandy definition for, for, for liquid for you. If, you. if your atoms are somehow very small compared to the spacing between the atoms, spacing between the atoms is uh, given by some distance d, then density is 1 over that distance cubed. So if the atoms are very small, this interaction parameter here, Na cubed, can, is going to be a very small number, perhaps 10 to the minus 5. This is a gas. And um, for the experts in the audience, a gas and a condensate is very nicely described by a many-body wave function which factorizes. If we turn up the, if the interactions between the particles are comparable to the spacing between the particles, then this value Na cubed now becomes around 1. It's no longer possible to write the the many-body wave function like this. In fact, it becomes a very difficult problem uh, requiring actually a lot of computational time. It's a very difficult problem to get any sort of physical intuition about. It becomes a liquid. And for the people who aren't interested in these, in these uh, formulas down here, basically what it means is here the atoms go around, and every once in a while they bump into each other. In a liquid, when one atom wants to move, other atoms have to get out of its way which is just basically a way of understanding the motions of all the particles per force are highly correlated. This is a difficult thing to understand. And we now have a tool to understand this, because what we can do is we can make a condensate where the wave function is known very, very precisely. It's given by this very simple, readily factorable wave function. We can suddenly turn up the interaction. And I should emphasize that we can turn up the interactions between the atoms on a time scale which is fast compared to all the other physics in the problem. What that means is we can create ourselves something which ought to be a liquid, but a liquid whose initial wave function is exactly known, because it's just instantaneously projected onto this gas phase wave function. Then, over time, we can study how the, the liquid correlations develop using such tools as um, rag scattering and so on. Some of these things you may hear about from, from Wolfgang. So I think this is one of the, uh, one of the interesting directions uh, of of Bose-Einstein condensate research. But I should emphasize that there are 30, 35 groups, experimental groups now working in Bose-Einstein condensation. There, are, there have been thousands of theoretical papers exploring many, many different aspects. So it's not possible to, to cover in, in anything like even these three lectures, which we're giving you now. And uh, this is one angle. There are many other angles to, to explore at this time. It's, uh, I think it's an exciting time in Bose-Einstein condensation research. And, and I, I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.